For two days, I've been trying to construct sentences without personal pronouns. Now I give up. What should I use? It? To us, as rude. What pronouns would you use for me? A lot of people often are confused by my gender. Oh, uh, please, please to know you, uh, miss? If you don't believe me, check out pretty much any of the comment sections on my more popular videos, which have people who may not follow me regularly. And often people ask this question by saying, are you a he or a she or an it? Now stick around because I'll answer the question about my pronouns by the end of the video, but it's that last option, the it, that really seems to be the most intriguing. And when it comes up, often reveals a lot about the intentions of the person asking the question. Why is any object we don't understand always called a thing? You see, while we typically only think about pronouns today in a transgender context like myself, pronouns are an incredibly powerful piece of how we interact with each other, transgender or not. And they can also be an indicator of something much darker and more sinister than you would think. How we use language to dehumanize the other. And one of the most common ways that we dehumanize others today is through aspects of gender. Not just transgender or not transgender, but even through women versus man or other things like that. So because it's my channel, let's use Star Trek to dissect the complex relationships between gender, language, and dehumanization. On Star Trek The Next Generation, when Data creates a child named Lol, Data decides to let Lol choose a gender. Gender female. That's right. Just like me. Gender male. Correct. And I am gender... neuter... inadequate. That is why you must choose a gender, Lol, to complete your appearance. We assume a lot of information about a person simply by looking at them. You can get a rough estimate of how old someone is, what race they may be, or learn if someone is a Trekkie all by looking at someone. All of these visual cues give us assumptions and context, correct or not, when you interact with that person. Yet one of the largest things that we assume about someone, because many, incorrectly, see it as simply a visual identifier, is gender. Western culture has trained many of us to look at gender instantaneously. We see someone has breasts or wears makeup, and we assume, girl, or we see a flat chest and a beard and we assume boy. And gender defines so much of how we interact with each other. As Troy states to Lol, Whatever you decide will be yours for your lifetime. It's a decision that will affect how people interrelate with you. And typically the largest way gender comes up and how people interrelate is through sex and attraction. For many, gender plays a huge role in our attraction to others, regardless of our sexuality, as Law finds out later in the episode. Gaiman, is the joining of hands a symbolic act for humans? It shows affection. Humans like to touch each other. They start with the hands and go from there. He's biting that female! Also, Law sexually assaults Commander Riker in that scene, but um, I think I think we're gonna move past that one for this. Now, there are some for whom gender plays little to no role in attraction, though your own definition of your own sexuality may differ. But our perception of someone's gender also influences so much else besides sex and attraction. It can influence how qualified we see someone for a job. Your world of starship captains doesn't admit women. It can influence what bathroom we use. It can define who you go and hang out with. A lot of men are told to hang out with more men and women told to hang out with women, especially at a young age. So it defines so many parts of ourselves, who we, our partners are, our social interactions. So if gender is one of the first things we assume about someone, pronouns are the first way that we signal to someone else that we see their gender. Pronouns are often the first time that we show that we know something personal about someone, something specific about them. But we assume someone's gender so imperceptibly, so quickly in the back of our mind, that we don't often realize that we're doing it. In The Outcast, when Riker meets a non-gendered alien race, he doesn't know how to interact with this person. Commander, there are no he's or she's in a species without gender. Okay. For two days, I've been trying to construct sentences without personal pronouns. Now I give up. What should I use? It? To us, as rude. We use a pronoun that is neutral. I do not think there is really a translation. Well, then I'll just have to muddle through. So forgive me if the stray he or she slips by, okay? 
Now, moving beyond the sad fact that the show's writers weren't aware that gender neutral or multi gender pronouns existed, Riker's discomfiture isn't uncommon today, even for people who know about the gender neutral usage of the word they. It's because someone like myself, or the character in The Outcast, who doesn't instantaneously fall into categories of boy or girl, we make that typically imperceptible thought process of deciding what gender someone is in your mind actually take up conscious thought, which causes confusion and discomfort for some people. I am called Tamun. Oh, uh, please, please to know you, uh, miss? You see, the overwhelming message from society teaches us that there are two genders, boy and girl, or man and woman. Now, I'm not going to go into a deep discussion on multiple genders here and the difference between gender and sex, as I've discussed that in another video which I'll link down below. So when someone falls outside these two binary gender categories of boy and girl, it becomes really difficult for us to place them, yet we want to place them in one of these two buckets. We want to say, you're a boy, you're a girl, and since I can't know the two, I have to think about it, and it's confusing and uncomfortable for me. And that's something that Riker is expressing in this moment. That uncomfortability with not being able to place someone in a bucket here or there. So even on Star Trek, a show which hasn't shown many, if any, directly transgender or non-binary characters, acknowledges that there are genders outside of two, and yet recognizes our discomfiture with trying to realize that fact within our language and within ourselves. And as I said before, acknowledging someone's gender is to show you know something personal about someone. When you use she to talk about a woman, you are acknowledging in some small way that that person is individually separate from anyone else, that you recognize their identity as a woman. To use the right pronoun is a sign of respect, to show that you truly see someone. In a lot of ways, even if we don't think about it, using someone's correct pronoun is a deeply kind and affirming thing to do. You're seeing their gender, you're seeing them as people. But it's more than just kind. Seeing someone's gender is actually life-saving. A UCLA study found that transgender people who were correctly gendered were 56% less likely to attempt suicide. 56%. And trans people are often the ones most likely, intentionally or not, to be misgendered. I'm willing to bet that if other cis people, i.e. non-transgender people, were also misgendered often, their depression and suicide rate would also go up. Because by not being gender correctly, you're walking around with people not seeing you, not seeing who you are, not respecting and understanding that you are a person with an identity of your own. By misgendering someone, you're making them an object, an object that you get to control, that you get to control the identity of, instead of them having their own autonomy. And most of us are good people, and we want to be kind to others and acknowledge that. So like Riker, if we don't know someone's pronouns, we often simply ask. It's not rude or cruel, it's just a way to acknowledge that you respect someone. You're asking information about someone, it's nice. Even further, we should all begin to practice asking someone's pronouns just like we ask someone's name, just to be sure we don't get it wrong. I mean, if I can look at someone and get their age wrong by looking at them, why can't we acknowledge that we may get someone's gender wrong even when it's obvious? I mean, someone like Tig Notaro, who has starred in Star Trek Discovery, and who identifies as a woman and has done so since she was born, has acknowledged that she's often seen as a guy because she had a double mastectomy. Right when we passed each other, he said to me, Oh, them a little titties. <laughs> I thought you was a man. <laughs> okay, that's not 100% fair that Star Trek adjacent, but it's a fair point. But okay, I get it. Asking for pronouns regularly is sometimes a hard habit to get into because, well, we all have been taught to just do so without thinking. And then we get into something that for many people causes a lot of fear. What if we get someone's pronouns wrong? He had a good student. He. Commander, there are no he's or she's in a species without gender. Oh my God, you got my pronouns wrong. How dare you? You're a piece of trash, you transphobic bigot. You're a racist. That is what many people fear will happen if they get someone's pronouns wrong. That someone will jump down their throat and make them feel horrible and small. Or that they're a horrible person even if they do it accidentally. And I even see it with people who are around trans people all the time. I have close friends who often feel really embarrassed if they get my pronouns wrong. I myself have even misgendered people and felt horrible about it because it meant I didn't actually see someone. But what really happens when we get someone's pronouns wrong? I goes on. After 81 years, I, I find you a Giamo looking woman. Kiss me. And Papa, just a great big hug. Oh, goes on, my beloved old friend. I'm Jadzia now. Oh, well, Jadzia, my beloved old friend. This moment is truly beautiful. Kor gets Dax's name wrong, 
saying Curzon, and Jadzia just instantly corrects him, and then Kor just immediately corrects himself. Jadzia wasn't angry or upset at being not gendered properly. Most transgender people, like myself, know that it sometimes takes a lot of time to reconfigure our entire brain's perceptions of other people, to fight past how we were taught to perceive gender from birth, to try and see someone as they are now. That takes a lot of deprogramming to do. For two days, I've been trying to construct sentences without personal pronouns. And most people understand that. I'm not saying that you should always get someone wrong, but as long as you're trying, you're not a bad person, you're just learning. Well, then I'll just have to muddle through. So forgive me if the stray he or she slips by, okay? And as long as you're trying to do better, as long as you're trying to get it right each and every time, and to try and do a little better every time, that's what matters. As Data says, We must strive to be more than we are, Law. It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. But this does bring me to the darker, more insidious problem with pronouns and acknowledging gender. You see, there was a scene that I showed earlier that showcases this horrible problem. And I am gender, neuter, inadequate. That is why you must choose a gender law. In this scene, the writers framed law being gender neutral as inadequate. Being outside of the gender norm of boy or girl is often seen as different, weird, or strange. I will instruct you well, so my provider will take you. That's what he kind of you miss, but... And it's easy to go from strange and weird to less than, not entirely equal, inadequate. We tend to see people who follow the norms of society or gender norms or people who look like ourselves as normal. And anyone else who is different from us in any other way is different, strange, weird. And so that word inadequate in this episode feels out of place in a show that has all been about celebrating diversity and difference in others. But it's one that's really revealing about the fact that how gender hasn't really been looked at at how it is able to dehumanize others. In a show that is really talking about how we dehumanize others in other areas, it sometimes goes unnoticed how easily it is to use gender to say that someone is different, and then to go from different to less than, and less than to inadequate. In the episode I Borg, a member of the Borg Collective, a hive mind that removes individuality from people, gets separated from the collective, and starts to regain a sense of individuality and calls himself Hugh. And in that episode, Picard wants to use Hugh to infect the entire Borg Collective, hopefully killing them all, considering that the Borg are one of the biggest threats to the Federation at that point in the story. Then Picard and Guinan argue over whether Hugh is a person or not. I need to hear you say that you are sure you're doing the right thing. If you're here to persuade me not to use the invasive program. No, I think I need you to persuade me. You see, both Picard and Guinan have a long history with the Borg, have a reason to hate them. And also, the Borg themselves aren't really seen as people. So it's very easy for both Guinan and Picard to dehumanize Hugh, to say that he's not a person and just a thing to be used. Yet, Guinan goes to see Hugh and starts to see him as a person. And it's an extremely subtle thing, but Guinan, who now sees Hugh as that person, calls Hugh him. But Picard only ever calls Hugh an it. And now you're here questioning whether it should be treated as the enemy. No, but when you talk to him face to face, can you honestly say you don't have any doubt? I haven't talked to it. Why not? I saw no need. If you're gonna use this person- It's not a person, damn it, it's a Borg. According to David Smith, author of Less Than Human, dehumanization is a response to conflicting desires. We as humans and as a social species generally don't want to kill, harm, or torture or degrade other humans. It sickens us. There are deep, deep inhibitions inside all of us that wire us to not want to do that. And dehumanization is a way of subverting those inhibitions. So when we want to harm another group or person, we have to dehumanize them. Dehumanization is defined as the psychological process of demonizing the enemy, making them seem less than human and hence not worthy of humane treatment. And dehumanization always starts with language. Nazis called Jews a German word that I can't pronounce, but it meant subhuman, and described them as rats carrying disease. And certain modern day presidents of the United States have also used dehumanizing language for minority groups. Last night I tell you to watch that thing on television and I, I did. Yeah. To see those, those monkeys from those African countries. <laughs> Damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. <laughs> Do you think I was talking about someone else, a different president? Because if you did, maybe that's telling on you. But anyways, moving on. So with Picard calling Hugh an it, 
He's stripping Hugh of a gendered identity. He's taking away a piece of what makes Hugh human, or Borg in this case. When you strip someone of a gender, when you start to call them it, you're taking away a piece of them. You're taking away and saying that they are less than you. They are worse. They are inadequate. They are a thing that you can use rather than something that you are able to hold up as something equal to yourself. And language is the first barrier to that. We are hardwired to attach meaning to the words that we hear, and words allow us a gateway to further more horrible actions. You start calling someone an it, then you start believing someone's an it, and then you start using someone as an it. I will not assist you. I. Jordy must not be assimilated. But you are Borg. No. I am Hugh. And throughout the episode, as Picard begins to see Hugh more as a person, he begins to become more unable to decide to use him as a tool, as a thing. And Picard starts to gender him. He seems to be a fully realized individual. And we see this mixing of dehumanization and gender numerous times throughout Star Trek. It appears in the episode Measure of a Man, where Maddox refuses to see Data as more than a thing, a toy for him to play with. And he only ever calls Data an it, as if Data isn't even in the room. How will you proceed? I will run a full diagnostic on Data, evaluating the condition of its current software. I will then dump its core memory into the Starbase mainframe computer and begin a detailed analysis of its construction. But when Maddox finally, for one moment at the end of the episode, sees Data as something that may possibly have consciousness, he uses he. He's remarkable. He didn't call him it. The Enterprise episode Cogenitor is an episode that gets a lot of things wrong in its depictions of gender and sex, but it does get this one thing right in showcasing how language dehumanizes. I wanted to point this episode out, even though it's a bit repetitious of what I was saying before, because it shows how far dehumanization can go, how subtle it can be. In Cogenitor, the Enterprise crew comes across a three-sexed species, the Visians, who have male, female, and cogenitor genders. Now, the Visians tell the crew that the cogenitor is subhuman, is less than, isn't intelligent or worth giving rights to. Yet, Trip learns that the cogenitor is just as intelligent as any other species, but they've been devalued, depersoned by their society. Once Kala and I are finished with it, I doubt it'll be needed before we return home. And what pronouns do the Visians use for the cogenitors? Will your cogenitor be joining us? It rarely eats more than one meal a day. And if you think that this is something that only happens in the context of gender neutral or non-binary people or transgender people, then take a look at the similarities between this episode's depiction of non-binary people and how women are treated in a show like The Handmaid's Tale viewed only for their fertility. They're only needed when a couple's trying to have a child. And when they're not? The cogenitor is assigned to another couple. They make up about 3% of our population, which seems to be a perfect ratio. Gender and sex are still ways to dehumanize, regardless of if you're cis or trans, woman or gender queer. Language is always the best indicator of dehumanization. It signals something much deeper. So when someone intentionally misgenders someone else, you're saying to that person that you don't see them. And it is a very violent act. We tend to think that misgendering someone isn't that big of a deal. It's just a pronoun, right? Come on, we can get over that. It's just a small thing. And I've encountered a lot of people online and in person who tell me that they're going to use the pronouns that I was born with because that's what they see. They see me as a man. They're putting their own personal perceptions of me over my own perception of myself. Even if you don't understand transgender stuff and transgender people, by placing something even as simple as pronouns over my sense of well-being and respect, it's telling me that you don't care about me at all. You're telling me that I'm less than you, that my autonomy to define myself means less to you than your simple interactions with me, to simply add a slightly different word to your sentences when you speak to me. You're dehumanizing me. According to a UCLA study, 56% of transgender people who were intentionally misgendered through pronouns at work attempted suicide. As I said before, using the correct pronouns isn't just respectful, it's life-saving. All right, so let's end on something a little bit happier, because I do have one last question that adds into this mix. It's all right, old man. It's me. <sighs> what are we to make of Cisco misgendering Jadzia Dax all the time, calling her old man? Clearly, Jadzia is a woman and goes by female pronouns. 
Isn't Cisco disrespecting her? Well, going back to me, because everything has to be about me, I actually go by several different pronouns. I go by she, her, they, them, and he, him. I'm fine with all of them. Yet when I meet someone, I often don't tell them that I'm okay with he, him pronouns. I don't lie and say that I don't like he, him pronouns, but just say that I go by she, her, or they, them. The reason being is that typically, because I'm a trans woman and was seen as being born as a man when I was younger, I found that those who wish to intentionally hurt or misgender me will often intentionally use he, him pronouns. So by initially revealing that I go by she, her, or they, them pronouns, anyone who actively and repeatedly use he, him pronouns for me, I now understand is disrespecting me. It's a way of protecting myself. Jetsia Dax actually does something similar, but in the opposite way. You see, she has an older relationship with Cisco. She lets Cisco call her old man because it's a term of endearment. Cisco knew her when she was an old man, and so him calling her that shows that he sees her. He knows something about her that no one else really knows about her at all. His using the word old man is a sign of knowing her deeper than other people. By calling Jetsia old man, Cisco isn't saying that he doesn't see her, but actually saying that he sees her better than anyone else. It's a sign of endearment, not disrespect. But it's only afforded to Cisco because he has a prior relationship with Jetsia, and Cisco has consent to call Jetsia old man. I've lived seven lifetimes, and I have never had a friend. In the end, that's what matters. It's all about showing respect, but more importantly, showing that we see someone else as fully equal and human. Pronouns are just one small way that we acknowledge both the distinction and differences of others, but also showing that we respect them as their own people. Respect them as something equal to ourselves. Sought out new life and treated it with respect and equality. That's it for this video. What did you think? I'd love to hear your favorite discussions on language and pronouns and gender in Star Trek in the comments below, or in other fandoms. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more discussions on social or political issues through Trek and other geek topics. And if you want to help make these videos even better and also get some cool perks, please give to my Patreon page. It really means the world to me and helps me pay the bills and get to do cool stuff. But regardless of if you subscribe or give to my Patreon page, I hope that all of you, as always, live long and prosper. And special thanks to my commander level and above Patreons, Stefan Schuhart, BBD, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Michael McGee, Lal Lindley, Wellington Marcus, Munir Amlani, Mari Nekar, and Marika Kuyetin.